Oh, hello there, and welcome to Phil Talking D20. That's right, you join me in my Jungle Command Bunker, where we're going to be taking a look at Player Core 2. So, Player Core 2, what is it about? It is the second Player Core book. Yeah, that's right, that's what you come here for. You come here for these incise clinical observations of Pfizer products. But, more importantly, uh, it's bringing back in a handful of classes, uh, more ancestries, a load more archetypes, um, some new feats, some new magic items. There's, ba there's a lot, basically, uh, going on with this book. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting is this is being treated as a core book. So you've got Gin Core, Player Core 1, Player Core 2 and Monster Core. With those being specifically stated as core books, we're at a point now where Pathfinder 2, as a remaster, now encompasses 23 core classes. So that's 23 core classes. If you compare that to what you get in the 5e core, if you like, that's 13 classes. Oh, but wait. Yes, I know. Obviously, D&D classes will have normally two or three subclasses per class. Whoop you do. They are also the case in Pathfinder 2. So the scale of like class diversity and player options is massive now. Um, and that's before you even look at archetypes, uh, which again, this book has a chunk of. Um, a lot of this content is from Advanced Player's Guide and things like that, uh, where they, and they've brought in other classes where they've been directly affected by things that have changed quite significantly in the remaster, things like alignment being removed and, and so on and so forth. But as it stands, I do believe that there are no more intended remaster class changes. Everything from this book forward will be entirely new, um, so we'll essentially see what happens with that. But I mean, that's a staggering amount of player choice. That's very, very cool. Um, so I want to try and give um, a very loose kind of overview of what's changed with um, the, the classes that have been brought back in. So that's uh, Alchemist, Barbarian, Champion, Investigator, Monk, Oracle, Sorcerer, Swashbuckler, all now as these kind of core class options rolled into this book. Um, the reason I want to start with a rough overview of what's changed on, on all of the classes in one go is because that's... That's kind of the meat of this book. Um, obviously, we have the following ancestries. Catfolk, Hobgoblin, Colo, which was Null. Uh, Kobold, obviously, Lizardfolk, Ratfolk, Tengu. Tripki, which was Gripley. Oh, it almost sounds the same. Uh, and then, obviously, more versatile heritage kind of options in that kind of area. Common backgrounds. There's a, a good handful more of these, Pilgrim, Courier, Root Worker, Tax Collector, if you want to play a really evil champion. Tax Collector sounds like a very good background to choose because Champion now is no longer alignment bound. Um, so they've got a lot of options that enable them to play what we would possibly look at as traditional uh, alignment based kind of villains, heroes and neutrals all in the one class. But we'll get to that. So, just to give that kind of rough flavour idea, I want to start with some of the kind of easy to find but kind of impactful changes to the classes, starting with Alchemist, the Alk of Mist. Um, Advanced Alchemy and Versatile Vials have been kind of simplified. I remember looking at the Alchemist and thinking, wow, that sounds really cool, and then kind of getting a bit buried in mechanics and kind of going a bit cross-eyed and running away. So they've done a good job, I think, so far, from my overview of it, of trying to kind of simplify, not stupidify, but make it more robust and a bit more logical. And I'll, you'll see why when we kind of go through this. So starting at level one, Advanced Alchemy and Versatile Vials are now simply... 4 plus your intelligence bonus and 2 plus your intelligence bonus for the number of items that you have available to you to do various things with. So you basically just have a very, a much more simplified model of 
how you get those items and then what those items can do. Uh, it means that with the versatile vials, they fast generate. This is a very nice little feature. If you're just pottering around in a dungeon not doing anything particularly kind of strenuous, you are auto-generating those vials so that they can be very quickly used and deployed and it stops you, which I don't think was a massive issue, but it, it basically just means that as an alchemist now, you've always got something in the, the tank fight to fight. Uh, it's kind of almost like they're... Um, it's almost like they've got a focus pool, it's not, but it's similar, of useful little spells that they've got in their arsenal, except they're not spells, they're potions. So, um, better flexibility, because obviously with the versatile vials, those are the ones that enable you to make changes on the fly to suit the situation you're in. The, uh, the alchemist now is being put in a position where it's the most adaptable, Re like reliable damage dealer you're never going to deal as much damage as a fighter or a barbarian but you're going to be reliably able to target weakness probably like no other class but that remains to be seen um powerful alchemy when it kicks in at fifth level is a really nice touch if you're making items those items often have their own baked in dc they've addressed that issue by now enabling to use your dc if it's better which makes sense, so that if you've made something, your DC is reflected if it's better, which is more advantageous for you because it means a target's more likely to fail, take damage, whatever it might be, which is nice. Um, they also now, importantly, get master proficiency with bombs and simple weapons at later levels, which means you're not in that situation where in very high level play against very high level villains, you kind of feel a bit like a spare wheel. Um, which was an issue that is prevalent in certain classes when you get to very high level play and fight very high level monsters. If you're not optimised, you struggle. So that was a really sensible adjustment because an alchemist is someone that's constantly using thrown bombs and potions and tinctures. Why shouldn't they be able to reach a level of proficiency equivocal to someone who spent a lot of time working with a sword or a shield or whatever it might be? So that is a very sensible manoeuvre. That's kind of a very loose overview of Alchemist. So a bit more flexibility, a lot more adaptability, uh, more, I suppose, robust mechanics that are a bit more logical and a bit more easily figured out. Um, and a bit of common sense focusing on enabling the character to do more in later play, which is important. So, champion, we're moving on, because I don't want to get bogged down in he said, who said, what said, what. Champion, no longer alignment bound, to a point. So, um, specific deities and specific causes do require you to have a, a, a limit on what you can choose, because you couldn't be like um, a champion of Seren Ray and then be like super evil, mega cruel, like evil git, because Saren Rain would be very upset with you. So there are some limitations, but they're not like the shackles of, oh, a paladin can only be an awful good from back in day. Um, so, holy and unholy uh, do have anathemas, but they're not particularly strict. This is another important step change we've seen in previous remaster products, where... They're keen for player agency to have more flexibility in how they play. Mainly because of the horror stories of the lawful god paladin who's just deliberately being obtuse and awkward. Um, those horror stories echo through Reddit as we speak. So causes broadly follow old school alignments. Um, desecration is unholy specifically. You can only be a desecrationist if you're unholy. Grandeur, which is pomp and kind of shazam and pow, is very funny, is wholly bound. Uh, iniquity, unholy, justice, liberation, obedience are effectively neutral. You don't have to be bound to holy or unholy. You can kind of almost not be neutral, but you don't have to be wrapped up in that whole extra mechanic. Uh, and then redemption, which is Saren Ray, holy. So those are the causes uh, and they all have their own distinct kind of flavour and path that's focused in and around either being uh, desecration, guess what that will be, 
pretty unpleasant, to uh, redemption, which is your anathema is you uh, you can't just deliberately kill people when you've not offered them an opportunity to redeem themselves, effectively. You're the redeemer. Um, Champion's Aura is back from 3.5, D&D uh, 3.5 that is, uh, which is a nice touch. That's another simplification mechanic to simply <clears throat> enable you to take certain things that you get as a class, like reactions and other abilities, and just have an area of effect to enable them. So again, it's a simplification mechanic, but it's one that's established in kind of the older game systems approach to what was at that time Paladin, which I'm all in favor of. So things like um, buffs to will saves against fear effects, or your ability to intercept and block an attack with your shield. It starts at about 15 feet. It can increase with feats later in the class. That's not something we're gonna bury ourselves into at this stage. I just want to give people those kind of flavours of each kind of major change. Mount is now no longer one of your special abilities, but it is a level one feat. Um, the three uh, kind of special options now are a permanent speed buff, um, which also applies to your mount if you take a mount, which is interesting. Um, so you can be a more mobile paladin. Uh, you've got the blessed shield, is still there, but now it's simply using the new reinforced runes that shields get as magical item bonuses like armor and weapons get, um, which actually is a significant buff because basically you're getting a free level four item if you choose that shield kind of buffing rune. And it's quite a significant buff. It's like, um, I think 30 uh, hit points or something like that on top of what your shield already had. It's it's strong. It's very strong. So you can be a really like potent defendery character, which is quite cool. Um, and then the weapon one is broadly the same, where it can have certain magical properties like ghost touch and things. So very solid. Uh, I'm glad to have it back. I was a bit kind of nervous. Uh, if I'm honest with you, it was the one that I kind of was was most curious to see what they were going to do with it. And it's very interesting how they've really opened up the class to being um, lawful, say lawful evil, chaotic evil, chaotic good, to use those kind of frameworks that I think a lot of people will be able to understand from role playing game kind of vibe and, and role play and um, more importantly kind of plot direction at the table. So very cool to see. Oracle, we're moving on. Pow, 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 it doesn't stop mainly because the book doesn't stop, um, and it's out very soon. Uh, to clarify and preface, I did get this copy from Paizo for free, but ba, 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 I bought this one with my own money. Uh, so read into that what you will. Um, I'm going to buy this one when it comes out as well. They gave me a copy to review. Um, it's not going to particularly colour my opinions. I'm already a fan of the system. So, like, intrinsic bias kind of goes out the window. It's like, oh, we'll bribe you by giving the thing that you want. Well, I already want it and already like it. Oh, well, it's not much of a bribe then. No, it's really not. Um, so it's not really going to be colouring my opinions too much. Um, Oracle, to get back on track. Curses now act as a condition. This, I think, makes a lot of sense. It's a mechanic that we're all used to in the game. Uh, we understand that the bad happened, the number go up, it get worse. Uh, <laughs> that's basically it. Um, to start with, it can't go particularly high. And one of the things that's that's quite nice is that, and I say that maybe it isn't, the thing that's quite nice is now that you're not going to always be increasing your curse. So it's kind of weird in a way to think about it that way, but... In the previous oracle, it was always a burden. It was always going to be something that was going to be debilitating you and afflicting you and kind of grinding you down and you would have to spend time and effort to nullify its effects before it built back up again. And there was that whole swing and balance of balancing that element to the class. Now, you can access some of your abilities and some of your kind of power without necessarily being afflicted by your curse. But I think one of the things that seems to be the case from, from kind of broadly trying to pick at feats 
and look at kind of how they've laid it out. It, it's very clear that there's still a, a reward from the risk. And what I mean by that is some abilities seem to get better the more cursed you are. But then obviously the flip side is that that might be affecting your armor class. So you might be more likely to take a critical hit. Um, but the flip of it is you might get something off that has a higher bonus to its damage because of the fact that you've got more curse. So there is still a risk reward play in the class. It's just not quite so heavily being kind of driven down your throat when you're just trying to do some little stuff. And I think that's probably better overall from an accessibility kind of and introduction to the class perspective. But also it's kind of more in line with this idea of the anathemas changing slightly just to give players a bit more agency. You can't avoid it altogether. So it's not like you can just cheese around your, your curse and go, oh look, I'm getting all these great massive bonuses, but I'm getting no penalties. That's not the case. So don't panic about that. Um, let's have a quick look at my other notes. Um, I think that really is it. Oh yeah, uh, another quick one. Um, more focus type spells. So they get a reasonable selection of focus spells, but they get the curse spells, um, which, in, which do increase your curse condition. But again, they're easily regenerated and you can remove your, lower your curse condition with 10 minute refocusing rests that are also steadily regenerating focus points and so on and so forth. So again, they're, they're pulling and centralizing in around some core mechanics that they've got that are established uh, that make a lot of sense. So again, I, I think overall that's quite positive. Uh, moving on to Barbarian. That's right, the Barbar -bar is back. I think it needed to be reworked. Out of the gate, I'm going to say that. I think... Pause for coffee. I think the original Barbarian was just a little bit lacklustre. Um, it didn't quite have the didn't quite feel like it had the grunt that it perhaps should. And they've done a, a pretty good job, I think, of, of just readdressing some of those issues. Um, some of the issues, some of the things that they're addressing with the remaster are simply the dragons. Obviously, a lot of these classes have a dragon aspect. Dragons have quite changed drastically in the remaster because they have moved away from uh, the chromatic kind of D&D &D style dragons and very much define their own new dragons uh, which are a little, a little similar but not the same uh, and so certain some of this is just because they've had to readdress those kind of features um, but not all of it and again in all of these classes to caveat things have quite often changed name but do the same thing that they did in the previous version of Pathfinder 2 but they just had to tweak the name because they felt they might be at risk. And then, so even though they, these are kind of the remaster classes, not every single feature has changed. Obviously, lots of little things have changed, but not everything has changed. So, um, you're gonna play a barbarian tax collector, um, who's very angry at people who dodge tax. Well, you knock on the door, and the person on the other side says, hang on one moment, and then you hear suspicious sounds and the GM says, roll for initiative. Change number one is that when you um, have a level one, you have quick to anger, which means you can go into a rage as part of your initiative roll, which is a very nice touch. It's again, one of these things that we're seeing in Pathfinder 2's Errata, where they've done it, and also in the remaster, where they're looking at action economy and trying to make optimizations. And one of the big grumbles is, and this existed in Pathfinder 1, it exists in 5th um, edition D&D, it, it, it existed in 3.5 D&D, was that it was frustrating to waste your first round as a barbarian to go into a range. That was always a thing. It's been a thing for a long, long, long time. No more. Uh, they've done the deed, uh, quick to anger, roll initiative, as part of your initiative roll, you can go into a rage. Boom, out the gate, swing in, the person throws open the door, 
and goes to punch you in the face and you're already raging so you just unload three attacks and be done with it and then you steal all this stuff in the name of tax. Um, they have again dipped into the magic of 3.5 and baked in a speed buff, uh, kind of early to mid level, as long as you're not wearing heavy armour, again a classic kind of coin from that kind of throwback barbarian, which again they're going back to they're going back to when D&D was good. And I know a lot of people buy 5e and say they play 5e, but that doesn't make it good. That just means it's popular. And that's not the same. It's not the same. The magic, when D&D was, was kind of at the height, before it became a kind of fashion brand, um, oh, I played D&D, was 3.5. And the reason why Pathfinder 1 was so massively successful and demolished 4th edition D&D was because Pathfinder 1 built off the back of 3.5 and was what kind of most people kind of jokingly say was 3.75. But that's another story. So, dipping into that magic. Um, this one is pretty scary. 11th level, Mighty Rage. On your first strike, as long as you've used um, Quick to Anger from memory, you double your um, rage damage on your first attack, which is, by that point, can be like, I think, 7 to 13 bonus damage, I think, from memory. Because there's some variance in the path. So, like, the uh, dragon and the giant um, archetypes for Barbarian do a chunk more damage... Uh, then the the kind of the fury, if you like, the just your innate anger barbarian. Um, but they have this proxy of you can only do your extra rage damage with your giant weapon, for example. If you're not using that, you don't get it because it's part of the weapon and you synergizing to make the extra strength, power and damage. But the same with the dragon. The dragon-based ones are relying on you dealing the elemental or particular type of damage that's associated with your dragon that you're kind of instinctively linked to. So, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. I, I can't see that crippling barbarian. That was a meta that was there in the 2e kind of previous edition, and it wasn't so much of an issue. But the damage buffs are significant. So... Compared to the original, there's a good chunk of damage on top and a lot to give now with the Barbarian. So it looks very, very good. No anathemas. They've all gone. Again, we've got rid of those. I'm not sure they were there. They were just they were playing with something. They've decided they don't like it. The community's not keen on it. Um, if you want to keep using it, keep using it. Don't, don't pretend that you're being oppressed. You're really not. Um... The only one that still has its anathema is the superstition one, and that's because uh, superstitions and anathemas almost go hand in hand. It's kind of intrinsic to the class. So that's the only one that remains. But it's been loosened off slightly. So again, broader, more flexible, less crippling, which is good. Um, pause for coffee, because we're moving on to Monk. Yes, Monk is back, thank God. I'm surprised it needed a rework. I thought <clears throat> it was already a very solid class. I thought it was leaps and bounds. Oh, a little monk joke there. Um, over where they'd been in Pathfinder 1, in uh, 3.5, in 5e. Monks are pretty pants in, in, in those games. And they've never quite been as potent as they were in Pathfinder 2. But we shall dive into it momentarily. Uh, it's a good cup of joe. Now, <clears throat> not a huge amount has changed with Monk, um, but <clears throat> Expert Strikes now baking crit specialisation, uh, Monastic Weaponry now pulls in Ancestry options in the way that like advanced feats work and move down. That's a general feature actually of the remaster it would appear. Um, <clears throat> they've made a lot of common sense adjustments so that um, weapons get moved into martial or simple in a more sensible way. An example of that is the Mauler archetype, which before was just 
oh, you get martial weapons proficiency. It wasn't particularly exciting to choose at level two versus being able to then get into like power attack at level four, which is what we all want when we want to play a two-handed weapon devastation machine. Now they've done the similar thing to this where they've basically gone, we, well, we understand that there's these things that we kind of left a little in the wind and we'd really kind of hidden behind kind of ancestry kind of weapon feats and things. So we're acknowledging that and we're pulling them in because it's sensible. So to kind of go to the Mauler example, which is the two-handed weapon uh, archetype specialist, now it's just two-handed weapons, even if they're like ancestral or all that kind of stuff, because they're saying that you should be able to get access to them. So if you're like an orc and you haven't taken ancestral weapon familiarity, but you then take Mauler, well then you would naturally gravitate to using some ridiculous mega orc death axe of mega death, uh, because it's orky and you're an orc, um, so why shouldn't you have access to it? That's the kind of attitude they've taken. It's a bit like the way they, again, loosened off anathemas. It's a very sensible approach. So that changes up those nice, nicely, um, makes them a bit more flexible. And to talk about monk um, as an archetype, to kind of touch a bit more on content, um, no longer can you take a level 2 thing that gives you the same ability as a monk to have infinite flurry of blows. I think this is a good change, <clears throat> and, a, and the reason why is, a flurry of blows is very iconic. Um, you make, you know, double attacks as one action, and you're punching at d6s, and you can do all the hand wraps, and you'd be very cool. And it gives you huge kind of flexibility on using your other two actions, for loads of movement. So again, you can take advantage of your agility, your mobility, your ability to kind of move around the battlefield, or use maneuvers. Two attacks, a maneuver, uh, whatever you want to go with from there, if it's failed, move away, disengage, whatever it might be. So they put a D4 cooldown on the monk archetype on the flurry of blows, uh, which is good because it stops you at level two having maybe spent an hour watching a YouTube video, to suddenly be as proficient as Bruce Lee at the one-inch punch. So I think that's a sensible move. I think they're just defining the monk's character and just saying to people, if you want to be a monk, be a monk. Don't just cheese a second-level archetype feat to get one of the not powerfulest features of the class by any stretch of the imagination, but an incredibly iconic and potent ability of monk. Um, plenty of name changes to escape the OGL trappings, and that's kind of really all I could see. Um, I think Gorilla Stance had gone, uh, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but if it has, the chances are it will be coming in another book. Um, I mean, in the moment, to pause on the content in here before we move on to Swashbuckler, um, I know the next book we've got coming is the... Um, NPC core, which is um, an amazing idea and I'm mega excited for because having a whole load of stat blocks and details for um, poachers and dock workers and um, miners and um, tavern like brawlers and gladiators and just all the myriad different NPCs that, that fill a world Having stat blocks, a load of stat blocks, but the, the captain of the guard, the, um, the the kind of the the wicked kind of philanthropist, um, kind of rumor uh, agent at the party, who's like causing strife for the king, um, <clears throat> the the mad wizard, the hedge wizard, all those kind of um, kind of almost like player characters. I'm going to say that's why they're called NPCs but that really actually fill a lot of your towns and cities and villages and pubs and inns having a book dedicated to them as a as a, a kind of a resource is just such a no-brainer such a great idea i'm super excited for that that's definitely going on my on my buy list because monsters and all that kind of stuff is brilliant it's great they are the wilderness they are the wilds they are the dungeons and the, the ruined keeps and castles on the mountain but they're not the contents of your towns and your cities and your seedy bars and your 
you know, all those kind of places where stuff can still happen, and it's just going to be nice to have that resource to round that out. Then I think we're probably going to be looking at a Monster Core 2. I think that's inevitable. I think there's going to be a Monster Core 3 and a 4 and a 5. Maybe not a 5, but we'll see. I think, you know, we're in the in the trappings now of them being able to fully recommit to going forward now that this OGL debacle is behind us all and we can all poo-poo wizards and move on. Um, not wizards the class. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. No, we're talking about wizards of the coast. Uh, swashbuckler, after this coffee break. Hmm. Splendid. Now, the swash of bucklers, the buckling swash, the daring, dashing, doing kind of Errol Flynn. Um, Panache now needs bravado. Bravado is now baked in to loads of skills and things. So they've made bravado a trait. And what they've basically done is they've kind of they've kind of gone no 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 this is definitely gonna this is definitely gonna grant panache because this is definitely something with bravado. I'm not sure this was really a big deal, but there was a, probably a small chance that sometimes a GM could say oh, I don't think that was swashy enough uh, when you've just like done five pirouettes through the air, swung on twelve chandeliers kissed five damsels as you flew past the balcony, landed uh, on your feet on a table uh, while simultaneously kicking two silver platters into the faces of two vampires while simultaneously stabbing another in the face. And, oh, I don't think that's very swashbuckly. I'm not going to give you any panache. And then you not get to use your finisher or whatever you were banking on because you needed it. So, after that ludicrous example... Um, this mechanic now means that it's far more, you're far more reliably going to get panache because you can easily see what gives, what bravado will generate panache, which is very important. Um, and I think one of the really important features is you don't have to succeed. You just have to not critically fail for the attempt of the skill or whatever it is that has the bravado trait to then get panache. So the class is going to uptick significantly in its ability to generate power for its finishes. One of the other things that's very, very cool is that before, when you would have to have panache to generate your, your precision damage, what they've done now is they've kind of split it into two tiers and you now just get a flat 2d6 precision buff to damage because of your fighting style and techniques that don't require you to have panache um, or be doing anything with bravado. It's just a flat buff. Um, I mean, it has uh, some very minor limitations, but in real terms, it's very much active all the time. Then your finishers, when you do those kind of big hits, when you've generated p uh, panache using bravado skills or whatever it might be, like a tumble through, etc., then you get to add additional precision damage because you've now got panache and you're able to then do the kind of the bigger hits. So that's a really nice touch. Um, it's also now been more defined and moved into the position of being the king of skills marshal. So um, I suppose to look at those kind of playing styles and kind of class design ideas like the investigator for example is a very skills focused uh, class that has uh, some combat capability but it's never going to be as good as a ranger or in this instance a swashbuckler but it's got a lot of skills and it's got a lot of and we're going to get to that shortly ironically uh, it's got a lot of those kind of mechanics baked into it that enable it to do more with story and plot and investigation than other classes. Again, the fighter, unashamed in its position as the 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 kind of the the the, the combat master. Uh, its focus is on the ability to smash and debilitate its opponents. That's what it does. The barbarian now is in a position where it can come out of the gate. Um, did I mention barbarian loses? The armor class bonus. If I didn't mention that, I am a fool of a took, and I should be thrown down a well in Moria. 
Um, but that's by the by. Oh my god, I can't believe I, I probably maybe didn't mention that. Yeah, you've lost that armor class penalty. Huge, huge boon that's again hung over Barbarian like a fart in a spacesuit for years. Um, and I get, I get all, all their reckless because they're not thinking straight. It's just like, yeah, but Conan didn't get, seem to get hit a great deal. And he was definitely the king of the barbarians. So maybe that trope shouldn't have been there. Now it's not good news. So um, back to kind of those kind of defined roles. The swashbuckler now can really be a really kind of potent alternative to things like ranger, which is another example of a, a skills marshal. Do you have the raw DPM output of a barbarian or a fighter? No. Do you have loads more skills that enable you to manipulate and develop situations outside of combat in a much more, and even in combat, in a much more advantageous way? Yes, you do. So, chef's kiss. Very cool. I like it a lot. Um, and again, I thought Swashbuckler was already a pretty capable class. So the fact that it's, it's had these little tweaks and reworks it just shows you that they're they're not afraid to kind of look at stuff. I'll, I'll come on to worries and concerns, but what I've just said is also going to allude to a concern I have now that we have technically ended the remaster era of kind of core class um, tweaks and, and modifications. Um, and, but we'll come on to that because it's it's probably... It's probably not a genuine issue, but we'll see going forward. And then if it needs erratering, because they have, Paizo have said, they're going to have a pretty steady errata process to kind of tweak things based on community feedback. I think a couple of times a year they've said they want to have a, a reasonable amount of content to put out as erratas where it's discovered and where it's needed. Um, blah, 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 blah. Oh yeah, here's another, here's another buff to Swashbuckler. Stylish combatant now buffs skills that grant uh, bravado, but this is a permanent buff um, that increases over levels. So they're like, oh, you need to use the um, acrobatic skill to gain bravado, and it has the bravado trait. But don't worry, we've given you a buff to that skill. Or oh, what, when I get panache from generating bravado using that? No, 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 you just get a plus one to that skill because you do cool stuff with it, and you're all, like, slick and showy. But that means I'm more likely to generate panache. Yep. Very cool. Like it. Like it a lot. Again, name changes. We've seen name changes in all of these class uh, classes to kind of escape um, the trappings of OGL. So we've mentioned it in the previous um, waffling. We're getting to Investigator. Some broad changes I've noticed in Investigator after this coffee break. Mmm. Carpet. So, Investigator. Um, very, very cool changes. I like them a lot. From from the base kind of core levers of the class, this is what I spotted. Um, Pursue a lead um, basically has been made a bit I say a bit more. It's been made more narrative focused. It's less mechanical and more narrative. Um, which means it's a lot more flexible and a lot more applicable in like any kind of environment you find yourself in. Um, which means that the investigator is now unprecedented in its ability to dig into a GM's worst nightmare of improvisation. Um, because the investigator can just absolutely drill into plot and move plot forward. It's, I mean, in many ways, actually, the investigator is a gift because you can literally just go, as a GM, I've got an investigator in my party. Um, what's my plot? Line it off. And every time they do in, uh, pursue a lead or... Uh, pointed question, literally just go, chunk of plot, mate, chunk of plot, mate, move, 
Move, move on. Move down the story. Move through my plot. That's what I want. I want you to move through my plot. There's my plot. You just throw it at their face. Uh, plot bombs to the face. Um, that's basically what they're built to do, uh, which is brilliant because it means that it's not like you can't do that in any other class, but if there is a skill check involved or if there is a, a kind of a mechanic involved, sometimes some players and some characters don't gel with those or don't engage with those well, and that can cause stumbling blocks. Whereas with this, you can literally just like dig into stuff and jump from A to B to C to D very smoothly. Um, devise a stratagem, a very obvious change here. Uh, a, a bit of tweaking and simplifying of text to make it a bit more robust. Uh, but more importantly, um, there is a skill option now for buffs on skills so that you can buff maybe um, you could buff deception. Um, to then roll a deception check, well, use that roll uh, as a deception check in a roleplay scenario to push it in your favour and also understand if you're going to fail. So basically what they've done is they've, they've, they've taken it from being a purely combat mechanic and they've enabled you to use it in roleplaying as well, which is very sensible because it's not that the investigator can't do combat, but again... They're not a DPM Alpha Smasher. They are a skill support combatant. Their job is to in, is literally to develop, investigate, push story forward, um, develop arcs, even accidentally find new plot arcs that you hadn't thought of that you suddenly kind of go, wow, that's really cool, I'm going to move in that direction. So, yeah, very cool very fun kind of element to that class. And Devisor Stratum being now much more open and flexible to non-combat scenarios and roleplay, big advantage. It's going to make them very potent um, in those kind of like, um, almost in, like sleuthing, interrogating, uh, persuading scenarios that can often crop up in games as being kind of make or break moments. Um, alchemical Sciences, uh, as one of their paths, uh, I checked it. It's obviously been brought in line with the new Alchemist changes. So that's not surprising. Um, with a free generation mechanic that Alchemist gets. Obviously, it's a watered-down version of it, but it's there. And they have brought it in line. Common sense. I knew they would. Um, pointed question, which is one of those class features that was the other way. It was focused on um, role-playing only. They've now enabled that to be also used in combat, so you can gain advantages and make people off guard, uh, whilst also getting the benefits of knowledge from pointed question. So again, very cool, very nice feature. Um, pursue a lead, um, being more flexible again means it's more applicable, so it can be applied in combat as well as in role-playing scenarios. So again, um, they're not revolutionary changes, but they're very fundamental twists and turns in the core of the class that enable it to get a bit more out of its key mechanics on both sides of the kind of role-play encounters, social encounters and combat now, which is great. Very smart moves. Uh, moving on, lastly, but my, by no means leastly, to Sorcerer. Now, um, some very simple things in here. Um, sorceress Potency, I think it was called. Um, any spell that you cast, you add your your level to, basically. Uh, the spell's level to. So they've kind of positioned the Sorcerer to be the ultimate caster because it's in your blood. You're born as a baby with mega magic in abundance. Uh, you will never not have magic because you're a Sorcerer. It's literally infused into your body uh, so they've done a very simple thing of saying, all right, well, they get a permanent buff to all their spells. So you're casting healing, you're casting damage, you're casting whatever it might be. If it has an effect that involves dice and numbers, you're adding the spells level on top. Very nice, very simple, very, very cool. Makes the point of going, if you do this, you're a bit better than people who have had to learn magic or be gifted magic. 
by the gods or the elements or whatever it might be. So that's quite nice. Um, they've taken a lot of the touchy spells um, that is a bit odd. There was basically, there was a, probably a good handful of spells where you would have to touch someone to damage them. Like you were some kind of like meaty uh, kind of melee character. And as a sorcerer, it's very hard to have a good armor class to resist crits and have a good constitution and hit points to resist damage. So being in situations where you'd want to deal damage and then having to walk up to someone, use a two action spell and then stand there going, I'm sure he won't definitely target me as the person with the lowest AC in the party and also probably the lowest hit points in the party. I'm sure I'll be fine. And then literally just being critted into oblivion. So they've made a lot of their touch spells simply have a 30 feet range, which is a very sensible plan because the, the idea that you could be a very effective, like, melee caster, you're going to struggle. And if you really wanted to do that, the obvious choice would be Magus, and even Magus isn't in a great spot. So... Those were, with the Sorcerer, again, to kind of look at a few more of the features. A lot of the Bloodlines have had tweaks and changes. Uh, a lot of the spells have been renamed. <clears throat> but there, there didn't seem to be anything hugely offensive or drastic. Um, they've made the Bloodlines um, have, a little bo bit, uh, have a little bit more pizzazz and a little bit more character to them. They, the Bloodlines each do a little bit more than they used to. But again, it's not like they're like absolutely like S tier nuclear death powered death machines compared to where they were. They're broadly, apart from these couple of little obvious tweaks, they're broadly the bloodlines. You know what you're getting into. They're demon themed. They're dragon themed. They're angel themed. They're that's not changed. So I didn't think it was worth kind of bogging down for ages on those. So. Obviously, I've mentioned there's a nice selection of, of backgrounds. I am a personal fan of Tax Collector because I think that's funny. Um, I just like the idea of being uh, the Tax Collector um, champion who is uh, like the lawful, evil kind of authoritarian one um, and literally just being a really evil git who just taxes everybody. It's very silly, but it's funny. Um, so overall... Um, the races, great to see. Uh, the, those ancestries are nice to have as core options with obviously what's in the, the kind of, um, you know, player core one. There's now a really nice broad selection of character options um, that are diverse, unique, flavorful, and give you lots of fun options. Plus, a lot of the other content for, from 2E that hasn't had to be addressed because it's clearly completely Paizo's own, um, and it's completely unique to them. Like I said, this is the last remaster book that we that they've had to make. So we're in a spot now where, if you want to use anything from Guns of Gears or the Book of the was it Book of the Dead? It's not Book of the Dead, but the one that was all about either opposing or being kind of the forces of undead, I can't believe I forgot the name of that book was, it was awesome, where you get the option to play like a vampire or a ghoul or a skeleton um, as an archetype, as a, you know, as ancestry and things. Very, very cool book. That that doesn't appear to be needing them to remaster address it. There are erratas on the, on the Paizo website uh, that will obviously be making little tweaks if there's certain things they're not happy with. Um, what I'll, I'll leave a link in the description to those errata because they're quite useful um, to check if you, you just want to make sure. Um, my, my, this is my concern with where we are now with the remaster, with these, all these kind of 23 amazing core classes being tweaked and modernised fully. Even if that isn't, like you've seen, absolutely kind of, you know, huge changes to the classes... My worry is, though, that those tweaks and optimizations will will start to make cracks appear in classes that haven't been touched. Um, 
my, the one that's ticking over in my mind at the moment because I've been discussing it as, as an option for a player in an upcoming game is, is Gunslinger. Gunslinger, because of the nature of the weapons it uses and the, what, the reload one, I'm kind of worried that we're going to start to see classes that haven't been touched start to struggle and suffer for action economy and other little things like that that perhaps the newer remastered classes have, have just ironed out and, and moved past. I don't know, That's because that, like I said, we won't know until we get a good few months of everybody kind of running campaigns where they've got people running remastered classes and people using classes that haven't needed to be remastered alongside each other for them to kind of start to see if perhaps with their new more focused keener eye on their 2e system whether they might regret not being a bit more heavy-handed with the classes that they didn't need to touch but again it's early doors so i don't think it's going to be a major issue and i think realistically the way paizo works if it is an issue they will address it because um, a lot of these changes in Player Core 1 and Player Core 2 have been directly based on the community's feedback. The, um, the way that Cleric got access to Heavy Armour as an option baked into the class because everyone kept saying, I just want to be able to take Heavy Armour and a Cleric. Why can't I take Heavy Armour and a Cleric? And there was all sorts of easy ways using um, general feats or um, archetypes that could give you access to heavy armour. But it was a bit of an, an annoyance to have to burn a feat that you might not necessarily need to burn. So again, that's an example of one they addressed. Um, Alchemist, another great example. Giving them master proficiency so that they can compete at high levels and not get left behind because why should they be left behind uh, is again a, a you know player community feedback that they've gone well we should have thought of that actually you were right we've made that change so I think in real terms the, hop the Paizo are in a great space they're now able to focus on creating exciting content that's not being driven from necessity you know when they started down the path of like Pathfinder 2 they had this long road ahead of them where they were going to create, create, and create, and create, and create. And then OGL happened and has thrown this curveball into the middle of their development cycle. I think it's a great and unique opportunity that they've seized very well because they've been able to make these kind of almost like structural changes, getting rid of alignment. Brilliant. Who really cared about alignment? Alignment was a system that existed really to handle how spells interacted with those that we viewed as the villains and those that we viewed as the heroes. You didn't really need it for anything else. That was really its main mechanic. Um, and it, it kind of put these breaks and these limitations and these holds on it where people are far more complex in life than the simple trope of lawful good. Um, and that's, that's the thing that they've kind of reached into and, and opened the door on now you can just get on with being the character you want to be which again i think is great so very impressed with the book very happy that they gave me a copy to review thanks very much paizo it's greatly appreciated um hopefully you've enjoyed this kind of brief overview of of the content of the book uh, like i said mine will go in order i live in the uk though so we just have to accept that america is like the focus of their print and release content so it's going to be a little while before I'm able to buy a copy. Um, these, by the way, I just want to talk about this. Um, the layout in the remasters is very, very good. The way that it breaks down where you are, it's probably hard to see, but effectively this nice kind of green finish here is very easy to see when you're looking at it. So right now I can see that the classes bit where I am in the book is highlighted, and then I can see underneath it in a sub-colour, I'm in the wizard section. So you can very quickly flick through. I mean, here you can see skills, skills more in detail, and then Arcana and Athletics being highlighted as what's kind of 
present on the pages is a really kind of nice feature. So it's very quick to navigate your way through things. Um, and again, artwork, lovely, also not AI, because Paizo, unlike Wizards of the Coast, are going to just fill their books full of AI trash, which is positive. Uh, if they do start doing that, I will bitterly complain. So don't think that's fanboyism. I will hammer that, that to the mast now. If they start dalliancing in the dark world of AIR, uh, they will get a snooty email from me. Um, which they will probably ignore as they're a big American corporation, but hey-ho. So, um, very cool stuff. <clears throat> very much enjoying the book. Um, it's great to have more content. Like I said, the, the scale of content versus 5e now is astronomical. So if you are on the fence <clears throat> and you do want to think about changing systems, one of the things that's important is you can still play 5e and 2e. This weird cult thing going on with 5e where it's like, we can never leave. And then this notion that if you stop playing 5e, somehow you'll never be allowed back uh, is very peculiar. So literally run some 5e, run some 2e, run some Blades in the Dark, run some whatever it is you want to run and, and just enjoy games and have fun. Um, but if you want unrivaled character and player facing options and you want the most robust and simple and easy to run mechanics from a GM perspective, from someone who's run D&D for the best part of 15 years, I mean, going back to 3rd edition 3.5, a little dalliance in 4th before moving over to Pathfinder 1, all the way through Pathfinder 1 into Pathfinder 2, a dalliance into 5e before I realised it was here. Trust me, this is a solid system that will treat you right. Enjoy, take care, I will catch you on the next video where hopefully we will be deep diving into the NPC codex where I will probably lose my mind at how many NPCs I'll be able to put in one tavern at a time. Peace.